to this now. South Africa and France have signed an anti-cybercrime agreement. This will see the two countries work hand-in-hand -hand to strengthen forensic cyber capabilities and investigations. South Africa's lack of prevention measures to tight the scourge was one of the reasons that the country was grey-listed. So will the establishment of the Anti-Corruption Academy in Tswane help remove the country from grey list uh, or from the grey list? For more on this, I'm joined by Patrick Bond. He's a professor of sociology at the University of Johannesburg. Mr. Bond, thank you very much for your time. Or rather, Professor Bond, excuse me for that. Uh, just uh, firstly, when I saw uh, Ronald Lamola sign with his French counterpart uh, that agreement to fight uh, cybercrime in South Africa, the first thing I thought of was the Financial Action Task Force, which put us on a grey list uh, earlier this year. And I thought, look, one of the reasons they gave is that, uh, uh, you know, we, whether we uh, can see it or we cannot see it allow for cyber crime to happen in our country and I thought will this assist us in government's own deadline of us coming off the list by 2025? Well thanks for having me and it really must uh, be one of those contributing factors along with much tighter treasury and reserve bank regulation and of course to have the Justice Department better equipped to have uh, our various investigating agencies better understanding how cyber crime works is always a plus. Uh, and if the French are going to also crack down because they're one of the guilty parties in many of the uh, investment scams and uh, cyber criminal networks, it turns out our uh, rating is number fifth in the world uh, for cyber scams, uh, number one at Britain, number two US, number three Canada, number four Australia in a February 2023 report just at the same time we were grey listed. Um, and the major reason for that is uh, we have not that many people, but enough who are gambling with cyber currencies, so the, especially Bitcoin. And we've, we've seen the turmoil where it lost 75 percent. And South Africa with mirror trading with a, a couple of young brothers from Durban who escaped with uh, allegedly billions. We've seen some of the worst cyber crimes in the world, especially in that space, the Bitcoin. And it does ask, uh, beg us to ask not just uh, how to detect, but how to enforce. And that's, uh, I suppose, going to be the question for Lamola. And then hopefully for uh, Minister uh, Enoch Orenguana and Reserve Bank, Bank Governor Lesecha Kanyaho, because the Financial As Action Task Force found them, you know, to be slackers on quite a few of these uh, uh, regulatory areas. Mm. And I thought to myself as well, and maybe you can explain to me, why should we be excited signing this with France in particular? And obviously I start thinking of companies such as Thales and the fact that that arms deal uh, corruption trial still hasn't started. And I thought maybe, maybe this is going in the right direction. <laughs> well, I hope so, because it's not just Thales. I mean, Total Energy is the biggest company. Yes, even Tubular. You are looking for. Yeah, and plenty of French companies. Usually when PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, does their uh, biannual economic crime and fraud surveys, uh, the French rank in the top 10. Um, and there are plenty of others like uh, Germany and, and Britain and uh, the US. But South Africa's corporates usually rank number one in the 2010s. We held that awful position of having the most uh, economically criminal companies. And I think if we're looking at about 50, uh, 53, I think it was from the last survey, 53 users per million uh, in, in uh, using internet uh, who get fished, especially. So the cyber crime hits when they accidentally give up their password, but particularly, as I say, when it comes to cyber currencies. And I think it's partly that here and various other places, a lot of people with money want to find ways to get it out of South Africa. So the illicit financial flows might, uh, by extension, be uh, clamped down upon if we get a handle on cybercrime, because so much of this uh, activity does occur, especially with Bitcoin becoming a sort of uh, routing of uh, choice around exchange controls. Even as those have been liberalized, the Bitcoin serves as some sort of, let's say, vehicle for especially rich folk to take money out of the country as fast as they can. And we, we know that's a problem that, uh, according to Treasury, uh, seeps out up to 7% of GDP a year. We have a, a financial intelligence center, but I don't think they're up to the task of halting. So I think, you know, any any contribution along these lines and any consciousness raising about the high level of, of corporate corruption in South Africa is all to the better, even if it comes from Paris, a place we might not normally look for clean business practices from.
Mm. But also, doesn't this speak to how the punishment works from uh, what you, with the agencies that you, for instance, just mentioned, your Fitch, uh, S&P Global, etc., and how they punish, um, you know, a country, for instance, I'll give an example with South Africa, compared to, the, I mean, the crime happens between two countries, right? A company in France and maybe a business and a government this side. So why are we punished the most? Oh, I think because we're in this disadvantageous situation, as are all uh, poorer countries compared to the rich Western powers, where it's their credit rating agencies, their mm. Standard & Poor's, Fitch & Moody's, who set the rules. It's their International Monetary Fund and World Bank that put loans down, but then major conditions, as we've learned since uh, 2020 with the austerity that the International Monetary Fund has imposed on us. So it's a reflection of North-South power. <clears throat> the other reflection, of course, is the dollar. And so perhaps in August, when the BRICS meet in Santon, there's some hope. I, I tend to think it mythical based on the failures to date, but some hope that the BRICS will advance de-dollarization and give us more sovereignty. To get that, though, and I know Liseko Kanyaho, our central bank governor, is very much against this sort of talk that uh, our BRICS Sherpa, Anil Suklal, uh, just earlier this month warned uh, that there was no talk of de-dollarization officially in the BRICS. But still, there's some hope that uh, because of perhaps Russia being shut out of the SWIFT due to sanctions and because of I think the desperate need and the power that the Chinese showed when they imposed exchange controls in 2015 and 16, that that would be one other way to go to restore sovereignty, not just cracking down on cyber crime, trying to get a handle. You know, Bitcoin is actually banned by the Chinese, and I think to, that's a good idea, but also to impose exchange controls so we keep more of the money in the country. And the big multinationals that normally do the illicit financial flows Finally, I hope the Financial Action Task Force grey listing compels our Treasury and Reserve Bank to put an eye on them now for a change. I must say something else I found very interesting, Prof, is the uh, news that uh, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, asking President Cyril Ramaphosa as the host of the BRICS summit this year uh, to invite him. This would be the very first European leader to attend BRICS. It would be so compelling, and if that's true, and it was reported by L'Observateur, which is a, you know, not that reputable a French source, and it was <laughs> picked up by Sputnik. And, you know, I'm not too sure if that's really a true reflection of Emmanuel Macron, because just think of a, of a very proud, uh, arrogant Frenchman like that. If he gets rejected, which logically he would by his enemies, in, in, uh, in, in, especially in Moscow, that would be terribly embarrassing. So let's watch that space before we believe whether Macron and any, anybody else would, would join the BRICS. Right now, there are about 20 countries, and none of them, uh, with the exception of Argentina and, and Mexico, the other 18 or so that uh, uh, you know allegedly applied are basically tyrannies and very carbon intensive. So it may be that in August we get a BRICS that's more defensive with its tyrants trying to hold on to their wealth and therefore promoting de-dollarization. But on the other mm. hand, that would make the kind of democratic changes in a multipolar world a harder place to achieve if this bloc consolidates in a tyrannical and, and carbon addicted way. Mm, that would be very unprecedented, especially looking at the current times, how journalists uh, from South Africa were stuck in Warsaw, uh, the fact that uh, we expect Vladimir Putin to arrive or not arrive here, and the fact that we are part of the Rome Statute. So that would be uh, very interesting. My very last question to you, Prof, just uh, in closing. Uh, a, good, a step in the right direction, this uh, signature uh, from Ronald Namula and his counterpart in terms of fighting cybercrime between France and South Africa. But of course, it doesn't help us uh, to get off the gray list unless actually uh, it's put into action, right? Signatures don't make any difference. Yes, I'd love to see much more prosecution and the extradition of some of the most uh. corrupt financial criminals. The brothers, of course, in UAE, a potential member of the BRICS Plus, <laughs> but particularly to have Lamola tell his colleagues, Kalingwana and Kanyaho in Treasury and the Reserve Bank, that they're going to have to get more help. Right now, they really do appear as slackers because this gray listing reflects so badly on Treasury and the Reserve Bank and their regulatory hunger to stop some of the, uh, let's say, illicit financial flows and various other forms of, of corporate criminality for which, regrettably, South Africa has a reputation of being still the worst in the world.
Mm, well, let's hope we become like Mauritius and are able to get off a grey list in less than two years. But of course, uh, we'll see with the action uh, that uh, government will actually take. Thank you so much for your time here on ENCA. Uh, professor Patrick Bond, he's the Professor of Sociology at the University of Johannesburg.